decision would have radically shaped the rest of history in addition to immediately killing potentially hundreds of thousands of people instantly just President Nixon's helicopter going over the fountains of the White House South Lawn over the black, black not the dude who is to quote brutalizing his own family but anyway just that I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook yeah people need to know if their president is a crook but more importantly I think people need to know if the person that they have voted into office is mentally fit to be the president of the United States. It would be pretty rad if there was some kind of standardized test we gave presidents before they were given the nuclear codes, you know, because we make kids take tests to see if they are fit enough to go to college where they have literally no responsibility other than the massive predatory loans are given, but maybe I'm crazy. Luckily for me, if I am, I can still run for president of the United States because unfortunately at this time, there is no such protocol in place. Currently, the only three requirements to be a United States president are, you must be born a natural born citizen, you must be at least 35, and must have been a resident for the last 14 years of the United States. Again, that's it. Nothing about mental health, criminal background, community involvement, etc. Nada. The concern over the mental acumen of the president isn't a new, new concern, however. According to an issue of the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1994, former President Jimmy Carter said, The president should be evaluated by an outside panel of medical experts because too much is at stake, you don't say. At this time, the determination is made by the president's personal physicians who must try to balance patient confidentiality and personal interest vis-a-vis -vis the national interest. We must find a better way. I would point to recent examples of potential mental illness occupying the White House, but honestly, I'm terrified of what might happen in the comments section if I say any names from the last two decades. The internet can be a real steamy pile of toxic trash. I also don't want to get my feelings hurt by incels and or mean 12-year-old boys down in the comments. And honestly, it seems like everyone who's ever held the office has done a great job. <laughs> Moving on, I want to share with you a wild drunken night from the 37th president of the United States, Mr. Richard Nixon, a.k.a. Tricky Dicky. My political career is over, and so we'll now go to other questions. I'm hoping that by sharing this story from the not-so-distant past, we may be able to give ourselves some permission to activate the critical thinking part of our brains instead of just mindlessly believing whatever rhetoric we are being force fed by media corporations, politicians themselves. And yes, your one uncle who without fail says something that makes everyone feel incredibly uncomfortable at every Thanksgiving. No position of power and authority is immune to corruption. And just because it has happened before in the past, it doesn't mean it won't happen again. Honestly, I tend to believe it's probably more likely to be exploited again if it's been exploited in the past. They've seen the weakness. So let's wind the clock back to 1968 to set the stage. I'm going to read an extract from the book, The Arrogance of Power, The Secret World of Richard Nixon. Nixon's public stance said that the start of the presidential race had been that he seldom drank anything. When I'm campaigning, I live like a Spartan, he declared, even as he was nursing a whiskey. Where the subject of Nixon and drink was concerned, the issue was of propaganda versus reality. Nixon told Theodore White, the authoritative election chronicler, that he realized that once in office, he couldn't take a drink again, couldn't party it up. You can't drink and think clearly. Two drinks and your mind isn't quite sharp. And you may not be able to think clearly when that phone rings at night. You've got to be ready. No more drinking. No more late hours. I felt I knew what Jefferson meant when he said the presidency was a splendid mercy. Pardon the terrible impersonation, but whatever. Computers may be twice as fast as they were in 1973, but your average voter is as drunk and stupid as ever. By his own account, Nixon first used sleeping pills in the late 40s. Sleeping pills. His fellow Republican in the 1962 California race, George Christopher, thought he used some pills to ease his mind a bit. Dispassionate pills to cool down. He was under great, great pressure. In fact, it became clear during our research, Nixon consumed large quantities of one particular drug over a long period, apparently without a prescription or proper medical supervision. 
The drug was Dilaton, the brand name of an anti-epileptic medication known to pharmacologists as Fintone. And the circumstances in which he came to start taking it were alarmingly casual. He heard about the drug probably soon after being elected president while dining at Key Biscayne with his longtime friend, Babe Rebozo. Don't know if I got that name right. And the millionaire founder of the Dreyfus Fund, Jack Dreyfus Jr. Dreyfus, who had contributed to the Nixon campaigns in both 1960 and 1968, had zero medical qualifications, none. Having credited Dalton with relieving him of chronic depression almost overnight, he had become the leading advocate of it as a panacea for all manner of elements, ailments. He poured millions of dollars in promoting the drug, which he considered a gift from God, with properties that could bring almost miraculous relief from disorders ranging from heart problems and asthma to leprosy and arthritis. Beliefs he still held at the age of 86 in the year 2000. Growing up, when my grandmother or people in my family would say crazy racist things or just say crazy stuff, my mom would always be like, they're old, you should listen to them. I'm like, I don't think that's true. I don't think it's true. If someone's crazy and they don't ever change, they're not willing to change, they're not going to get better over time. We've all had that terrible ex. And then you meet up with him years later. You're like, oh my God, dodged a bullet. You don't think, oh, if I just would have waited it out, that crazy, that psycho person would have gotten better. They would have become an amazing ambassador of goodwill, uh, good fortune, critical thinking. That's not how it works. This dude is crazy, totally crazy. And he was just given the president of the United States unrestricted, unregulated unreg amounts of sleeping pills and prescriptions under the table. Totally crazy. These are the people that make decisions that affect our lives. These are the people that make decisions that affect the lives of people 40, 50, hundreds of years later. Whew. I'm back, back to the excerpt from the book. And in all of my years of public life, I have never obstructed justice. At their 1968 meeting in Key Biscayne, as Dreyfus told us, Nixon said, why don't you give me some Dalton? So I thought, what the heck? He's going to be president of the United States. I can't get in trouble. <laughs> so I went out to the car and got a bottle of a thousand and gave it to him. A few days later, he called me and said, is it all right if I take two a day? I said, yeah, I think so. Later on, when I went to see him at the White House, he asked me if he could have some more. I gave him another large bottle. I asked Nixon what he wanted the Dalton for, and Dreyfus was vague. Nixon said, he had a lot of things, a lot of worries. The physician's desk reference used by U.S. doctors nationwide lists numerous adverse reactions to Dilaton. They include slurred speech, decreased coordination, and mental confusion, dizziness, insomnia, transient nervousness. This would explain why there are accounts of Nixon stumbling around the White House seemingly confused, disoriented, but stupidly, happily feeding his dog treats while taking some nibbles of the treats for himself. Dr. Lawrence McDonald, a Washington physician we consulted, was alarmed at the notion of anyone, especially a person in a high position of responsibility, using Dilaton in uncontrolled doses or combined with other medications or alcohol. If such a user of the drug were the President of the United States, McDonald said, I would be very nervous. Mental confusion is not something you want in a leader. No shit. Dalton certainly could impair someone of that caliber from making correct, timely, and appropriate judgments. It's a potential time bomb waiting to happen. Nixon did use alcohol and did use sleeping pills. His longtime speechwriter, Ray Price, recalled how even a single drink could make him appear drunk, as if the drinking, the sleeping pills, and the Dalton were not troubling enough at times he resorted to amphetamines. And once I'm swept into office, I'll sell our children's organs to zoos for meat, and I'll go into people's houses at night and wreck up the place. <laughs> All right, so there's already a lot of videos and articles about Nixon's drunken, rage-fueled presidency. But at least in the few videos I watched, none of them mentioned the sleeping pills. Honestly, that's pretty wild. And it elevates all of these stories to a completely different level, at least in my opinion. I mean, I can't be the only one who gets cryptic messages from elderly people in my family at 2 a.m. I can't imagine one of those people being in charge of this supposed free world. Look, I can't attest to the amounts of stress that has to come with being in that position of power. 
But I quit drinking because I honestly couldn't function as the president of this tiny suburban home. But to be fair, I'm more like the vice president at best, but whatever. What's the Spider-Man quote, <laughs> the cliche quote people use? Uh, With great power comes great responsibility. So now that we have a little backstory, let's time warp to 1969. <laughs> North Korea in 1969. If the president had his way, there would be a nuclear war each week, to quote Henry Kissinger. After Nixon left office, Hunter S. Thompson wrote, It's probably a good thing in retrospect that only a very few people in this country understand the gravity of Richard Nixon's mental condition during his last year in the White House. There were moments in that year when even his closest friends and advisors were convinced that the president of the United States was so crazy with rage and booze and suicidal despair that he was only two martinis away from losing his grip entirely and suddenly locking himself in his office long enough to make that single telephone call that would have launched enough missiles and bombers to blow the world off its axis, or at the very least, kill 100 million people. The date is April 15th, 1969. A United States Navy Lockhead EC-121 Warning Star of Fleet Air Reconnaissance Squadron 1 was on a reconnaissance mission. The plane was shot down by North Korean aircraft over the sea of Japan. This resulted in the death of 31 Americans. Now I'm going to read from an article published by NPR on July 6, 2020. A former U.S. fighter pilot has come forward with a story about a nuclear alert just hours after the attack. Bruce Charles was on temporary duty that day at Kunsan Air Base in South Korea. He was on standard alert as part of the Single, Single Integrated Operational Plan, or SIOP, the plan for nuclear war with the Soviet Union. His assigned target was an airstrip in North Korea. Earlier that afternoon, his commanding officer called him into his office. Charles says, When I got to see the colonel, it was very simple. He described the shooting down of the EC-121 about 100 miles at sea and that he had received a message, which he showed me at the time, saying, prepare to strike my target, Charles says. The military produced the options, ratcheting up the level of military force all the way to all-out war and to using nuclear weapons. Robert Wampler of the National Security Archive, Charles, then rechecked his F-4 fighter jet weapon it was carrying. He says it was a B-61 nuclear bomb with a yield of about 330 kilotons, not the biggest bomb the U.S. has, but 20 times the size, 20 times the size of the bomb dropped over Hiroshima. Then there were several hours of waiting, Charles says, and the order came to stand down. The order to stand down was just about dusk, and it was not a certainty, the colonel said. It looks like from the messages I'm getting, we will not do this today. I do not know about tomorrow, Charles recalls. Charles' story could not be independently confirmed, but not long after the North Korean attack, the, the New York Times, citing sources in the Nixon administration, reported that there was discussion of a nuclear attack against North Korea. As you read through the rest of the article, there is no mention of why the strike was called off, but it has been widely reported that Nixon, who was appropriately upset by the news, made a snap decision to nuke North Korea. This decision would have radically shaped the rest of history in addition to immediately killing potentially hundreds of thousands of people instantly, just and then creating untold generational trauma for all of the survivors. Why did the president of the United States make such a hasty decision involving nuclear weapons? If we could wind back the clock far enough in time, the real answer to that question might involve a scared little boy, Dickie trapped inside a powerful, scared man's body, just trying to prove to his mom that he is a stronger man than his daddy, and he can take care of the family better than his own dad. I know that sounds like a generic daddy issues joke, but let me read another excerpt from The Arrogance of Power, The Secret World of Richard Nixon. Dr. Arnold Hutchnecker, who for many years served as Richard Nixon's psychotherapist, believed that Nixon's father, Frank, had been, quote, brutal and cruel, a man who beat his sons and brutalized his wife. While the doctor viewed this as an enormously important factor in Nixon's makeup, the heart of the problem actually, he believed, was Hannah, Nixon's mother, a devout Quaker. Clinically, Hutchnecker said, it started with his mother. Nixon's mother was so religious, he was trapped in many ways. I wouldn't say that Nixon was really religious, but he was totally devoted to his mother, almost like a robot. 
Even to the last days, you know, he was kneeling down to pray every single day. He was completely smothered. His mother was really his downfall. It's kind of wild just to think about the patriarchal structure that we live in. His dad beat the crap out of everybody. But the professional is like, it's probably his mom who said you should have faith in a higher power. Not the dude who is, to quote, brutalizing his own family. But anyway, just, I'm not a psychiatrist, so I don't know if I, I, I don't feel completely comfortable saying that that doctor was wrong. But just like, in my humble opinion, after, you know, reading about this for the last 20 hours of my life, it doesn't seem fair that we blame the woman when it was the dude kicking the crap out of everybody. Whatever. Looking back, Hutchnecker suspected that Nixon had guilt feelings for having pursued politics in the vindictive style of his father rather than on the saintly path of his mother. Nixon's fervent wish, the doctor felt, was that someday he would be able to say to Hannah, Mother, I have made peace. Now I'm worthy of you. Look, that would be an absurd turn to take in this video. Because clearly, unresolved daddy issues and other underlying mental conditions seem to have no relevance on who holds the nuclear codes. So we'll go with this answer. Nixon was drunk when he found out about the airstrike and gave the orders. Which I guess you could dismiss as merely a coincidence, but these angry snap decisions and requests to nuke those sons of guns were quite common in the White House in 1969 and 1974. So why would it be any different on this April evening? Henry Kissinger, the national security advisor for Nixon at the time, got on the phone with Joint Chiefs after Nixon had given orders to strike, and somehow he got everyone to wait until Nixon woke up the next morning sober. It's honestly pretty wild reading this story, and um, there are so many accounts, by the way, of different times that we had bombs dropped on people or close calls during this era of the Nixon presidency. Um, it's, it's honestly pretty wild to think that all of human history can be affected by people, mostly men, in positions of power, drunken with rage or drunk with like actual intoxicants in their body, making these insane decisions. As we wrap up the video, I want to get real personal with you. One of the reasons I started researching this video is because I've recently quit drinking and I've been trying to figure out what, what kind of content I want to make around my decision. And drunken moments in history were one of the things that came up for me. Mostly because I find the hypocrisy surrounding alcohol to be insane. Like if Nixon were using any other drugs at the time, like the illegal ones, outlawed by the Lord, baby Jesus himself, <laughs> people might have been more concerned. I mean, I know people are going to listen to this and be like, what? He was just winding down. Everyone deserves a reward, a nice scotch, a nice bourbon. People think that because alcohol is legal, it's fine. To quote my late grandma Bubba, she spent her entire life living in a tiny town in Ohio. I don't know much about marijuana, except it's illegal. So that means it's evil on a sin. So anyway, I started going down the drunk Nixon rabbit hole and I had to stop myself, especially when I started diving into Pol Pot and Cambodia. According to the part of the book I read for this story, there is a drunk phone call between Kissinger and Nixon where Kissinger mentioned the number of American casualties in a major battle in Vietnam. And Nixon said, oh, screw him. <laughs> anyway, maybe, for, maybe that's a video for a later time. For now, this is the first deeper dive into drunken, weird, and unfortunate history. So to be honest, I'm not sure how much interest there will even be, but I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about other drunken moments in history that I should cover. And I will see you again soon. Bye. Thanks for being here.